somehow, at this time of year, you always manage to catch me on what I feel is a really good time for the organization. And then I come back the next year and say, you know, after I said all of that, something terrifying happened. And here's the story of that terrifying thing. So that uh, is sort of how we're going to lead off today. We're going to start off talking about where we are, where we're going, and I'm hoping to give you the narrative arc of Mozilla over the last 12 months or so and how that's gone for us. It's gone, short version, reasonably well. I'm really happy with the way the organization is going for a number of different reasons. We're going to get into them. And let's start with December 2018, though, which starts with the scary part. And that's this. At the end of last year, you may recall that Microsoft gave up on their own rendering engine for their own Microsoft Edge product. New versions of Microsoft Edge are all running Chromium under the hood. And that was, at the time, quite a concern. And it's a concern for a lot of different reasons. A number of people, the reflex among a few of us at first was I'm sure the reflex that a number of you had as well, like ding dong, the witch is dead. Right? We've put down Internet Explorer, we've put down IE, but that's not the same. Right? This, for us, is not a victory. And it turned out not to be a huge concern for us, less of a concern than we would have thought. On sort of careful, sober reflection there, we understood the incentives that were forcing Microsoft into this position their job as an even more niche browser than us at the time. The job of that team was not to get on this web-compat nightmare treadmill that they were on because, of course, it turns out, and we know this full well, making a web browser is quite difficult with or without spontaneous guitar solos occurring in the back, which I think that's what that was. Um, but it turns out that a much more important question is in play here. There's no such thing as a standard for the web, for any technology, unless there are actual competing implementations of that standard. It doesn't matter what the on paper standards say if only one vendor is actually producing the code that interprets those standards. So for that, that reinforced the importance of our work. It reinforced the importance of Mozilla's mission and Mozilla's goals for maintaining the web as an open, interoperable, public resource. And to have an agent acting on your behalf within that public resource. The future belongs to everyone. That is the vision we have. The web is not somebody's property. And the only way for that to keep being true is if there's more than one person making an engine, if there's more than one person, more than one organization, championing the standards of this organization so that you can point back and say, no, 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 this isn't how you do it. We have real standards and they matter. I left with this question, uh, one of the questions that I asked last year uh, as a sort of philosophical note, and this has become only more important for us over the last year. Uh, at the time I said, what is, like, what is software? At the time I had, a, some of you were here, you might remember the song and dance that we did then. Uh, those of you who might not have been here, how many of you would have a really good answer for that at the time? At the time, some of you had your hands up. Other people didn't. One person pinned me to the wall and said, I thought your answer to that was the most ridiculous, preposterous, pretentious thing I've ever heard. Um, and I don't think they're here tonight, which is unfortunate, because I was going to stick it to them. Um, but the important thing about software remains that it is an idea. It is something that we take out of our heads and turn into a machine. Right? Unlike almost anything else. And it's a machine that is built out of our values and our priorities. And it turns out that that matters a lot. Right? Your priorities and your values as a developer, as an organization, those end up having a real profound impact on your code, on the way your code affects the world. The analogy that I like to give is, have you ever used Waze? Who's here has used Waze? couple of hands, you all know that Waze has a feature in it that lets you avoid or route around checkpoints or police, you know, police checkpoints in the road. Right? What do you think the odds are that anybody on the Waze team has ever had a loved one killed by a drunk driver? None. There's no chance that that has ever been a part of that team's ethos. That's not part of their experience. 
It'll come as no surprise to you if you've ever mucked around in the guts of the Android permission system, which is a comedy goldmine. Right? You can't get an SMS unless Google Play sensors can read my heart rate. Sure. Right? But when you read that, it'll come as no surprise to you that the creator of Android actually believes that one person can own another. Right? Those are real things that happen with software. Those are real places that our values as creators get baked into our software. And that matters a lot because here's your OSI model. This is the 2019 version of what used to be the OSI model. Right? That's it. That's the whole thing. It's a bunch of doped metal and then a bunch of software and then all of us. Right? And all of us covers a lot of ground. Right? It's pretty exciting when the people at the top end of that includes not just people in this room and how we vote, right? how we spend our time, where our traffic signals go. It's also how the stack deals with non-state actors. Right? It's also how the stack deals with criminal enterprises. This is how does your software, does your software value free speech more than safety of the people participating in the system or the other way around? Right? You're making a value judgment in there, and let's not lie to ourselves about how software is objective. Right? My colleagues had some good fun with this when they found the draft, <laughs> um, which <laughs> Android this, uh, which was it's always it's always good to have the feedback of your and support of your colleagues. You know, here's someone else. This one's a little bit dim, so if you're on the screen recording, this actually says me. The only competitor in the area is somehow worse. There's NX domain hijacking, there's buffer bloat, there's carrier grade NAT, there's 100 to 1 under provisioning, and then down here at the bottom there's 25 year old copper wire. So all is not perhaps well in the world of software today, but at least we have an understanding of why, right? These problems exist because we built them. Right? And we can take responsibility for that. So the other question I left you with last year was where do people need Mozilla to be? And in light of that, in light of the fact that there's now one less player on the field, uh, in light of the fact that we have a much deeper understanding of the fact that our values show up in our product, um, we have a couple of good answers for that now. Which brings us to this. This is early in the year. We've done a lot this year, and I'm sorry I've got to gloss over a bunch of it. One of the places people need Mozilla to be, in fact, is the future. One of the places we need to be is to show that we are not just rebuilding the past and not reiterating the web as we used to have it way back in the day. We all have fond memories of the way the, back, the, way the web was and the way the internet was way back. And they're fond in the way that, frankly, that old people's memories of childhood are fond. Right? Not because things were really, back, really better back then, but because we understood a lot less. And we could see a lot less of the world, and a lot less of the world could see us, and we had a lot less responsibilities. That's all changed, and it's not coming back. So our goal as an organization can't be to try to rebuild the places we've been, and try to build a little tiny nest that feels like a security blanket out of the technology we used to have. We have to be not only forward-looking, but we have to be aggressively forward-looking. If we want our values to stay relevant, then we have to go where, we have to take our values and our engineering to where the puck, to, put, to borrow a phrase, is going. And one of those things is here, right? Because oddly enough, our partner in this is Microsoft. Right? We're working the Servo team, and I mentioned Servo last year as well, I think, as the experimental web browser built out of Rust, that extremely powerful, very parallelizable language uh, that we developed at Mozilla a few years ago. The experimental language became an experimental web browser. And it turns out that one of the things that this experimental browser does, working on the Mozilla VR work that we've done and the augmented reality work that we've done, is it runs really, really well on relatively restricted hardware, which is something that other competing browsers in this space really have a hard time doing. I've got some other notes here. Right? So the interesting thing about this is not just that we've built a thing that shows up on HoloLens. I will tell you, if you haven't had a chance to try this stuff, though, it is mind-blowing. 
Like this is the stuff we used to see in science fiction movies. It's astonishing. But the other thing that's really great for, the, for us and we hope and believe the world is that this is a chain of events that leads from an experimental language, an experimental browser, a new experimental possible future. One we think is going to be very, very relevant because I don't think many of us here would be super enthusiastic about living in a virtual or hyper-augmented environment where you can't have things like an ad blocker or being able to mute people or being able to decide what stimulus is going directly into your eyes because that's how that works. And so it's a place where not only has our technical acumen as an organization paid off big, but it's a place where our ideology is in a very structural way paying off as well. The fact that we want to have this be unowned. The fact that we have, want to have this be something where new people with new ideas can make new discoveries in a way where they're not relying on a whole stack of tools that accidentally give some other incumbent somewhere a massive piece of leverage if they decide to get, if and when they decide to get involved. So that's good fun. Right? We've, built a, we've doubled down again in this new space on the idea of the user agent. And what we're finding out is that this idea that we are beholden to you, not just as an individual, but as something other than a conduit for commercial interests or a conduit for advertising, means that a lot of people are interested in working with us on this. Because we're not only technically competent, but we're not threatening. Right? We're not going to pull the rug out from under them in the process. Uh, in the process of doing this, this around this time of year, um, and you're getting geared up to ask this question, uh, I was also asked, what comes after IRC for us as an organization? This is another really old protocol. Um, hands up, you used IRC? Yeah, every hand in the room, I know it. Ugh. All right, tough crowd, but it's going to be OK. The, um, the idea here uh, at the time was that we're also engaging at the same time as we're trying to change the culture and change the nature of the world outside us, we're also going to have to figure out how to change the nature of culture within Mozilla. One of the things that I think is the reason that I was given this task is because of a lot of uh, writing that I've done about how not only has open source changed and changed the world, but also how the nature of working in the open has changed. As I mentioned earlier, there is a lot more people out there who want to participate in this. And there's a lot more people out there who don't want it to happen, who also are able to raise their voices in this environment. We have to figure that out. And I'll come back more to this a little bit later. Uh, but it's been an exciting couple of months for that. That brings us largely to here, which is where we start to push in the product something that we worked on, not just as the idea of the user agent, but perhaps more importantly, the idea of an opinionated user agent. right? more importantly than that, still your opinionated user agent. This is when we started working on default tracking protection. This is when we started to work on blocking bad actors and acting on your behalf as a user agent in a way that isn't just, OK, we'll take in whatever and we'll do whatever. But if you say something to us, well, we'll maybe some change it. Maybe we'll change this. Maybe we'll change that. You know, maybe you have add-ons. Maybe you've got an ad blocker in there. So we'll, you know, we'll respect that. If you've got add-ons uh, that block ads, then we'll let them block ads, and that's fine. And this represented a very subtle but important sea change for us as an organization. Because this was one of the earliest times where we stepped beyond some fairly clear boundaries around security and a fairly limited boundaries around what is clearly unintended, unsecure behavior and started to say, no, this is not the web we want. People acting like this on the web is not the web we want. Your privacy is not the web we want. Right? Your privacy being invaded, I should say. Your privacy is definitely the web we want. I should, and I'm going to try to get that part cut out of the speech. But that's, pardon me. Um, that's when we start shipping new defaults. Uh, default to tracking protection. This, is, this has been and remains a very controversial move for us because so much of the web is ad funded now because so much of the web is relies on the very very aggressive but incremental monetization of tracking information across multiple brokers to keep all of this stuff afloat and that market is a nightmare it is depending on who you ask it is between 35 and 75% fraud right 
And these are all vanishingly small fractions of a cent being exchanged in exchange for recirculating your information in a way that you have no say over, no agency over, and no visibility into. And it's, a, it's a disaster. Uh, and it really can't, like, this is absolutely not sustainable. This is why so many, uh, there's an, the challenge though is that there is a great deal of market capture and learned helplessness within that market, uh, within website monetization and within website sustainability. And it's a very serious cultural problem for us. One of the teams that uh, is working on this is the Pocket team, is working on new ways of actually generating privacy respecting, ethically safe you know, publishing models that allows monetization to occur in a way that actually also respects your decisions as a user about what you choose to reveal, what you don't. And we're working on all these all at the same time. And all of that is coming together under a number of tools that we released around this time. One of them is this enhanced tracking protection that I was talking about. This second one is good fun, DNS over HTTPS. Um, can I get a show of hands? Uh, if I asked everybody in this room to give me a list of all the websites you ever go to, and in exchange for that, I'll give you nothing. Nothing at all. Can I get, would anyone here like take that deal? Can I get, no? How many of you would actively tell me to go to hell if I proposed it? Right, a lot of good show of hands here, that's strong, right? Some people would start swearing, um, and that's fine. But that is, right now, today, that is the relationship that you have with DNS right? and your ISP. Uh, one of the things that your ISP, unless you've got a commitment from them to do otherwise, which at a glance seems unlikely that all of you do, because we've got a room with more than two people in it, right? that's the relationship your, you have with your ISP, is that your ISP sells your traffic and sells the bulk of the traffic. And they do that to allow, of course, better targeted advertising, and the circle of life continues. There are a couple of ostensible safety measures that people build in at the nation state level at, at uh, different borders involving user safety. We need to be able to see into users' traffic to protect them from this, that, and the other thing. Why won't you think of the children? That has been an ongoing discussion that we have, and we have to have that discussion essentially on a per jurisdiction basis because we roll out Firefox in various languages on a per, on, as often as not, not always, but as often as not on a per jurisdiction basis. And so we have to be very careful and very politically adept when we're rolling this out to different countries at different times. Likewise, Firefox Send is, Firefox Send is very straightforward. It is a medium-sized file transfer service that lets you send and receive encrypted files it relies on a lot of the same synchronization tools that, or a lot of the same synchronization cryptography that we use for Firefox accounts and our synchronization services. So it goes from point A to point B and we can't see what's in it. It's not very big, the files aren't very big, but it seems to be a popular add-on. So that brings us to uh, end, of, uh, end of April, beginning of May. And uh, May we had a very difficult day, and that was this. These are the stickers we made after the fact because, as um, one of my colleagues pointed out, uh, getting stickers is how we process trauma <laughs> at Mozilla. Um, but this is uh, this was a couple of days where, uh, due to an oversight on our part, a certificate expired. This is a byproduct of a massive technical change that we had done two years previously with respect to add-ons and certifying add-ons. Uh, one of the challenges of allowing arbitrary code to execute within your browser, which is roughly the same as saying allowing arbitrary code to do whatever it wants within a context where all of your personal information and everything about your life has taken place is that the bad people show up there and do the things that bad people do. And so that was our reason originally for our dramatic changes to the add-on model. And one of those dramatic changes to the add-on model was cutting off the 
anyone can do anything model uh, because it turned out that the anyone can do anything API model, the anything, pardon me, the anyone can do anything at any times uh, add-ons model had some extraordinarily bad consequences. Uh, most notably, and this is true of everything everywhere, I suppose, on the internet, is that it is much, much easier to automate bad actions than it is to curate good ones. Uh, and in this case, changing our add-ons model meant doing a bunch of things, including signing the add-ons that we allow into our consumer, pro into our final product. And in this case, our belief about how that certificate was checked turned out to be incorrect. And so one day, at the end of it, and thankfully, knock on wood, it was a Friday. On that Friday, uh, all the add-ons in all the Firefoxes stopped working because, pardon me, sorry? Yeah, it was super exciting um, uh, and super stressful. And our leadership at the time, uh, for starters, this was correctly judged to be an existential issue for this company. This is our one distinguishing feature. It is the thing that we do, it is the thing that distinguishes us as an organization. Increasingly now that ad blockers are sort of going away over on, over when browsers that are provided by companies that sell ads, they're less than keen about having ad blockers, it turns out. We still believe in that user agent, but it's not clear how much we believe in the idea of the user agent if this stuff breaks. Like if we leave this stuff broken, how much user agency are we really giving people? Right? If we are not investing the effort in fixing this as quickly as we can, is, are we telling the truth about who we are? Turns out we think we do. We think we are telling the truth about who we are. And that's what got us to this, which was an astoundingly difficult weekend where everybody in the organization who needed to be a part of this stepped up. Everybody who was asked to step up was absolutely amazing, heroic work, right? People who were not involved in this at all stepped up to try and do communications outside of engineering, community management, our volunteers, our contributors as a community raised their game. And we solved this problem before Monday morning. Right? We got fixes out to everybody within 12 hours. We started rolling out copies to all of our, even users on outdated versions of our software. People on versions of the software as far back as, God, I think 52, we went back into the high 40s. Stuff that we haven't touched or updated in ages got updates just because it was that important for us, for our user, for us to make sure our users knew that we're not leaving you hanging out to dry. Right? That's not who we are, that's not how we work. Right? More importantly, because of the update mechanism we were using, part of that update mechanism queued off a telemetry cycle, right, where our user telemetry systems go out, ask for updated data, provide us information there. And this is one thing that I am particularly proud of, right? Is that we had to make a lot of really hard decisions. We had to make, we had, we had people, more importantly, that all the work we were doing, there were people who looked at our process partway through it, saw telemetry connected to getting the updates, and turned on the telemetry systems that they had previously turned off deliberately so that they could get their browser fixed. And what does that mean for us, right? We still believe in user agency, we still believe in user choice, and we still believe most importantly in respecting user choice. So once this was done, once we got this problem solved and fixed, we didn't just have to go back and fix our process, you know, we didn't just have to fix our clients, we didn't just have to fix our process to make sure that this didn't happen again but we had to take all of the telemetry data that we received for that entire period, all of it, and throw it out. It would have been really useful to have that around. We probably could have learned a lot from it. There was a small number of people, a, in theory, because we don't know, in theory, a vanishingly small number of people who opted in to telemetry so that they could make their browser work again. That's not consent, right? Charitably, 
that is coerced consent to have their data gathered. Right? And that's not who we are, and that's not the standard we set for ourselves. So we tossed it all. Right? In addition to the heroic work we did, in addition to having the entire team, I am, on the one hand, I hope never to be a part of anything like this again, because damn. But on the other hand, it was immensely rewarding to be a part of a team where everybody shows up and not only does some amazing technical work, but sticks to our principles in the process. Right? We don't throw out our principles because we're having a bad day. We don't throw out what we believe in and who we believe we are because this is hard. And it was hard. And I'm glad it's behind us. I'm proud to have been a part of it, and I never want to do it again. So that brings us to sort of here. Um, this is the beginnings of the next sort of, once we get all that, once we get all that behind us, this is the beginnings of the next phase of what Firefox is shipping, of what Mozilla is shipping, the versions of Firefox Mozilla is shipping, and what we are starting to become as an organization. Uh, and that's Trailhead. This is a code name. It's not really a valuable uh, piece of information for you as a as a project name, but it was the name of it was the name of the or the project I should say leading up to the release where rather than providing all of these tools for people, we started turning it all on by default, enhanced tracking protection on by default, right? All of this stuff where we are being an opinionated, not just an, a user agent, but an opinionated user agent. All of that stuff starts getting turned on for our default users by default. And it turns out that this has become a really big deal for us. Because we're not only turning this stuff on by default, we're not only being opinionated about what your browser does and what you see it, but we're also saying so. One of the weirdest things about default settings, and one of the, the most powerful and most pernicious things about default settings in software, is that they are default settings. Someone else has considered them, so you, the user, don't have to. Right? And that's great if it is all just sort of the, just works. That's great if it mostly does what you want. If it doesn't do exactly what you want, it's often very difficult to discover that. But worse, for us as a, an opinionated organization, if we're doing stuff for you that adds value to your life, in a way that's completely invisible. That means that you as a user don't see it. You can't care about it. You can't be enthusiastic about it. So we had a, our user research team ran a couple of tests earlier in the year where rather than blocking tracking, blo blocking I should say traffic or tracking widgets. What do they call them? Those little icons, the social media tracking icons. Um, there's a name for that that I've forgotten. Uh, tracking, tracking pixel badges, I think. Tracking, the tracking badges, whatever they are. Rather than simply blocking those things within trans traffic protection, what we did was we have a little note on the screen saying, this is what we're doing. This is why. That little widget you see is how Facebook follows you around the web. That little widget you see is how Twitter follows you around Amazon when you're there, right? They put the badge there. And this is how they follow you across various parts of the product and the web. And the reactions that we got from our test audiences who saw that stuff for the first time, for us, it's nothing. For us, it's like, yeah, OK, yeah, I get it. It's blocked. Go ahead. But for people who don't see the guts of this, don't see the guts of this process, right? For people who have not opened a developer window and watched this sausage being made for years, it is a revelation. People, light, people just light up like, oh my god. So this is how you do that. And it, it was magical for us, because all of this stuff that we have believed for a long time, now people are not only getting sort of vocally excited about when they see it, they're getting actually kind of sweary. Like they start swearing at their screen, oh, you weasels, this is how you track us. I hate you. And then they'll go on with their lives, right? But there's all these people who are now seeing this stuff presented to them for the first time in a way that is not just made visible, but that is made like viscerally understandable. It's not just a question of having the UI pop it up. The teams that we have who have worked on the text to make sure people get an honest explanation of what they get there um, have done amazing work as well. And this is the, 
sort of next step of the process for us is to go from being an opinionated user agent to being an actual proactive user agent. Like we do things for you and we tell you about it. And it, this turns out to have been a very, very valuable discovery for us. Because we've been talking for a long time about the importance of privacy, there seems to be a sea change in the market now where people are starting to value, like people are in the news valuing privacy, I'm being followed around by the, on the web, what's going on. We've known about this stuff for years, we've been building it into our products for years, the protections from those things, but just showing, instead of letting it be default, instead of letting it be the hidden settings behind it, has been enormously valuable. It has been, it's the beginnings, we can see the numbers being the beginning of a sea change for us. Uh, which feels pretty good. Uh, it feels very, I mean, it feels very validating. You know, it gives you a reason to be a little bit smug, and so you try and avoid that. But yes, when, yes, being right the whole time feels good. Um, don't quote me on that, but it's amazing. And that's the lead up to sort of where we are now and what's coming next. And I kind of want to tell you about it because a lot of the things that I hinted at are coming due in our next release, which is, and I think, two and a half weeks now, two weeks, less than three weeks from now, the next version of Firefox is coming by. And I want to tell you about a whole bunch of stuff that's in it, but I'm not going to, because I'm not allowed. And it's not that I'm not allowed because it's not all in the product. Like if you go fire up Firefox nightly, you can see a lot of this stuff sort of lurking under the hood there. Um, but the reason I don't want to tell you is because we are planning a major announcement about this. Uh, we're planning to make a big deal out of it, and I think it's worth making a big deal about some of this stuff. And I don't want to spoil anyone's, you know, we, this is the culmination for us of a number of things that we've kind of hinted at over the last little while. I feel kind of bad saying this because we're supposed to work in the open, and in fact, all the work is there if you want to see it. But I also kind of don't want to spoil the surprise um, because we have a communications team and a public relations team now who kind of likes being able to surprise people pleasantly. And I don't want to ruin their lives because they can turn around and make mine difficult as well. Um, but stay tuned. Like the next couple of weeks are going to be big weeks for us. And we feel pretty proud of the work that we've done to get us here. Uh, so like what else has been going on? This is, that is all Firefox all the time. And I talked about a few other things uh, last time I was here, which also have been rolling. Firefox preview, uh, which I introduced to you as Phoenix, uh, one of F-E-N-I-X is how I spelled it last time. But this is uh, the, Fire, the new version of uh, Firefox for Android. It's really, really good. It's really fast. We've gotten a lot of things right here. And the team that has built this stuff has built it out of a stack of technology that we have been working towards for a while called Android Components. And the Android Components system, if you were here last year, um, if you were here last year, um, I said um a lot, and it was kind of painful to watch. But if you can skip past all of that to get to the point where we started talking about building our values into our software, one of the ways in which we are putting the thin edge of the wedge into the mobile market now is with a set of componentized Android widgets that let people build their products on top of our values, our privacy values, our tools, our encryption standards, and that has gone extraordinarily well. That team has been under intense pressure to ship over the last year, and they've done so. So if you've got an Android phone, if you've got an Android device, you should check this out. It is worth your time. All right, again, this is a user agent. It's an opinionated user agent. It's one where you have a say in what it does, and it'll actually respect that say. We have the other thing coming along. We've had Firefox accounts for a little while now, and Firefox accounts are becoming the foundation of our it started out, this is an evolution of what we used to call Weave and then Sync, the synchronization tool we have to uh, let, you mig let you move in a secure manner, in a, in a non, in a, I should say a privacy respecting manner, uh, move state between different copies of Firefox. So if your passwords go from here over to there, um, we can actually synchronize your passwords, synchronize your, uh, synchronize your browser tabs, synchronize your bookmarks and history across different instances of Firefox that you've built into um, in a way that is cryptographically secure. We can't see into it. Um, we designed it originally so that we can't effectively answer a subpoena about it. But the, uh, that tool and that technology is about to become the foundation for a set of tools and services that are the basis of 
essentially a relationship between Mozilla, between Firefox, and you. And that's the next step that's coming up. Everyone kind of knows that ads are not going to last for very long. Uh, and the whole situation there, as I mentioned, is pretty grim, but there's a lot of people out there who we can deliver a lot of value to if we know who they are, understand what they want, and that's coming up as well. So the common lesson of all of this stuff is this is a lot of speculative work we've done over the last two or three years that's really coming to a head. It's paying off. We're going to be shipping in the next couple of weeks. And it's been very rewarding for me to be a part of it. Uh, we are, as an organization, we have gotten better at better at basically everything um, than we have been in the past. And that's been really rewarding to see, not just from an engineering point, but from a management, from a coordination standpoint as well. We're just moving better as a company. We're moving better as a mission than we have in a long time. Um, and it's been rewarding for me to be a part of it. Uh, because the culture part matters, right? The part where we are talking to each other better, the part where we are coordinating our efforts better. Um, on, from my own perspective, uh, my own job here has changed a lot, and one of the things in which I am, one of the things that I should say I am very happy that I didn't get invited to, oddly enough, is that I've spent a lot of time at Mozilla helping disparate parts of the organization talk to each other helping disparate parts of the organization realize that they had common interests. I've spent a lot of time making sure that this part of the organization over here that was thinking about you know, productizing this thing as a service and maybe running a virtualized this over here, and that this part of the company over here that was running some other sort of virtualized thing that they were trying to figure out how to do knew about each other so that they weren't duplicating a lot of effort so they could see if they had a lot of common interests. I've done that a lot, and when Trailhead came along, I was not really involved. Right? And I say that not out of anger or anything. I say that because the whole organization, engineering, marketing, communications, worked together. right? Planning, testing, worked together, executed really, really well on that from stem to stern. And that would not have been possible three years ago. Three years ago, four years ago, um, if I was lucky to have found out about those disparate efforts, I might have been able to get a few people into meetings and tie a few things together with duct tape and bailing wire and maybe get two of those teams or three of those teams into a room and maybe on the same track. And uh, because we had this fragmented culture, because we had this fragmented management structure, and that is just not the case anymore. Right? We are vastly better at that than we ever have been. We are getting better at it in, really interestingly, in both directions, right? We are, as an engineering culture, we are both able to embrace cooperation and rapid change at the same time as we are embracing something we've also struggled with in the past, which is standardization and commonality of efforts, right? Reducing duplication of work while being able to iterate rapidly on the tools that we are using to do that work. And um, yeah. And it's been really rewarding to see. And I think that if you uh, bear with us for a couple of weeks here and uh, click update when Firefox asks you to update in about a, less than a month, uh, that you'll be able to see the fruits of that work. Again, I don't want to spoil it. I really want to, though. I really do want to spoil it, but I'm not going to. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the state of Mozilla right now, is that despite a couple of, you know, despite a little bit of bad news, and the, the edge thing was concerning but at the time, the other thing that we realized is that a lot of the companies that rely on Chromium do not realize how big a treadmill they've just strapped themselves to by making that choice. Uh, and we hope between Firefox uh, Quantum, between current versions of Firefox Quantum, between Android components, and, and a few other things in that space that are coming up that we'll be able to give companies that have made that choice a better choice. Right, so that's going to be exciting as well. Uh, on the other side of things, uh, the fact that we came together very rapidly and very quickly over add-ons. I'm going to share you, or Armageddon, I should say. One little anecdote uh, that I will share with you in that was that for some reason, they asked me to go and make the stickers. Like, okay, I'll, I'll make you stickers, I guess. Um, and then I went around to see if we could make shirts for people. Um, and the answer was no. I'm like, well, we make shirts for everything. Why can't I make shirts? And how about... How about, I said, 
we make some shirts or sweatshirts or something for the people who really, really did a great job or really you know, excelled in that moment. We know who those people are. Right? And the answer to that was a hard no. Absolutely not. Because we are not going to foster a culture anymore where people are only recognized for heroism when something goes horribly wrong. Right? That's just one, a little bit of a taste. Like it, when you say it like that, it, yes, it absolutely makes perfect sense. The guy who said that to me was like, oh, you're right. We're incentivizing all the wrong things if we go down that road. Except that we've had a history of doing that in the past. And we currently have a leadership layer who has a deep understanding of what cultural incentives look like there and are not letting us make the easy, obvious mistakes to make anymore. That's helped a lot. That has helped us a ton. And to have that layer of leadership with not only a deep understanding of the, me of the mechanics of the process, but the mechanics of the culture uh, is really, well, it's, it's kind of flattering. It's, um, it's a great honor to be a part of this at a time when we are not only improving, but we're getting better at getting better. And so yeah, uh, that's it. That's the whole story. You asked about the state of Mozilla 2019, end of the year. Things are going really well. Like well enough that I'm concerned. Like there's a, there's a, in, in terms of I'm involved in this IRC thing, which is coming due very shortly. But uh, one of the things that I've been doing, whenever something goes well, I don't know, I don't spend a lot of time on Reddit, but there's one called Premature Celebration. There's a sub, the Premature Celebration subreddit is, a subreddit where you go to watch one cyclist put their hands up in victory and the second cyclist pass them on the line. Right? It's the place where you go to watch people celebrate right before they lose. And whenever I feel like things are going too well, I always just look at that and I think, no, 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 lock it down. This could happen. Right? Never celebrate until you're over the line. But it feels like we're going to get over the line. Right? It really does. So that's the state of Mozilla right now. Is It feels like we're feels like we're making really excellent progress. feels like we're about to ship a lot of stuff that really, really matters. And it feels like we're going to have an important voice in the future in the process. So thank you very much.